I want to raise two things before I begin my talk. The first is that this notion of the fractal, the name of the panel, and also uh, what sort of deals a lot with my work, is in counterdistinction to the word fragment. And I want you to just remember that. Uh, and the distinction is that a fragment is a piece of a whole, like a one fourth is four section, one a quarter of uh, four sections. Whereas a fractal, there are no edges. So a fractal is a slice, but it's a slice of a dimension or of time. But something weird, because even when you say time, you think one, two, three, four, or something like that in terms of seconds, and they make marks. And the disk was not ejected properly. There you go, thank you. Uh, and I would like to excavate, or anyway steal, Mandelbrot's notion of fractal. I've been stealing it for quite some time now. He's like a soulmate to me. Uh, in order to think differently about how meaning is made manifest, in order to think differently about um, what most uh, artists, theorists, technicians, whatever, seem to think is required for um, meaning, and that is uh, a line or a limit. And just even as Daniel was talking about, you know, this whole sense of the horizon, when you don't have a horizon, madness. And I want to challenge that a little bit. Um, so that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is my abstract. Terrible. I decided, you know, this happens every now and then. You know, you have a flash of what you think is really brilliant, and then it turns out you go, that's completely wrong. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting, and I kept it in the book uh, because mm -hmm. it's wrong. And I, but I want to point out that I, it's wrong. <laughs> so try and remember that. And I want to tell you why it's wrong. So the, the abstract is called... Um, what well, the paper is called, uh, After the Dark Room. And I realized that there is no After the Dark Room. The reason I had originally thought about After the Dark Room was because I was thinking analog, digital, dar actual dark rooms, this kind of thing. Um, and I was, at the time, I was working on a book uh, by uh, uh, Nicholas Abr Abram um, on rhythm. And he had asked a question about rhythm, which I put in my um, abstract saying, you know, how do you ask something to speak, something to say something when it is silenced and it, it has no way to communicate? How do you actually do this? And he goes into what he calls the psychoanalytic aesthetics. Um, and he starts talking about, you know, various problems like, um, the, the, you know, the complex and repression and habituation and anxiety and translation and so on. And so I was going to make a, a nifty little comment about this. And I got completely into the idea that I was going to go into, as I put in my thing, uh, what happens if we ask this about the information age and you have something with Cynthia and Dolly Sheeps and this and that. And I, got, I was completely like delirious with joy that I was coming in with this stuff. And then I realized it was completely wrong. I uh, just set it up. So now I'm going to explain to you what I think what it is. I don't think it's about leaving the dark room at all. Indeed, um, I think we need to embrace our inner dark room. I'm calling it a dark room aesthetics without the beautiful or the sublime. So it's called uh, After the Dark Room, Animaterialism and the Sensuous fract Fractalities of Speed and Light. By the way, fractality is not a word. I made that up. Fractalities of Speed and Light. Or does the image still speak a thousand words? In my world, there has been at least there has been at least three different types of dark rooms. The laboratory, with its chemical baths and dull orange exposures. The back room sex clubs, with its fetishized rhythms and differently organized friendships of circulation and very interesting forms of exchange. And finally, the closet, with its secrets and wounds, mm -hmm. and dreams, and escape plans inserted neatly behind and between shoes and trousers and shirts and suits. Each has its own set of rules and regulations, its own dangers and provocations, its own pungent aromas, mess, and light source poetics. All require a particular, a particular technical knowledge, a practicality laced with, say, an expertise specific to each of those very different 
darkroom spatialities. So they all require a specific technical knowledge. To varying degrees, each might require some form of curiosity, experimentation, risk, tugging on the wider and sometimes wilder sensations of attraction, destruction, reason, taste. But most of all, and, some, uh, and no matter how different each dark room might be from one and the other, they all have one thing in common, one thing that puts them into the realm of the dark. Each in their own way work off the collapse of the past and the future into an immediate intensity. The collapse of the past and the future into an immediate intensity that draws together and indeed swallows up subject, object, anything in between or on its path, swallowed all up into a black hole cohito, a black hole cohito dot of a being there, right here, right now. Let's unpack that remark. In saying a black hole cohito dot of a being there right here, right now, I mean that all the expertises, curiosities, wonderments, and so on, specific to each spatiality, as named above in those dark rooms, create a bond. Let's say it's something akin to a magnetic attraction with rough edge consequences. And I emphasize rough edge because, as many of you may know, for those of you that are studying Mandelbrot or studying with me, studying Mandelbrot, Mandelbrot's whole thing about fractals was to understand how one could explain roughness in nature, not sameness. He didn't call it difference. He called it roughness. And I wanted to make that very clear. Let us say that it's akin to a magnetic attraction with rough-edged consequences, like the coastline in the, by, by the sea. That is to say, consequences emerging out of something quite different than rational, logical deduction. In this case, that is, in our darkroom case, one is not only in the moment, one is the moment. But there is more. For this self in that dark room is not some kind of homogeneous Sherlock Holmes in search of the truth, nor is it necessarily a room with discrete boundaries like walls and floors and ceiling wax. Rather, it is a multiplicity slice fragment of self fastening on to what lies to hand, where the fastening, that is to say, as it were, not to mention the that which lies to hand, is couched, Heidegger might say, and framed, precisely by a double helix set of relations. This double helix set is on the one hand colored by one's actual abilities. Actual abilities established, say, through discipline, knowledge practice, i.e. being good at your trade, be it art, sex, or rock and roll, or all three. It is created on the other by the spatial temporality of a being there interior, by a spatial temporality of a being there interior, i.e. the dark room itself, kitted out with well-chosen, or at any rate, more or less chosen, tools of the trade. Ingredients including smells and sounds and, contact and contours of the odd bod materialities inadvertently or otherwise lying to hand. This heady, volatile mix creates a coincidence. It creates a coincidence in the strongest sense of the word to co-inside a coincidence, and in so doing drags that spectator, subject, fractal, slice self into the mix, into the being there interiority mix, simultaneously, violently, brilliantly, instantaneously penetrating that cohito fractal self and immediately also being penetrated by it. It sets up what Jean-Luc Nancy calls a contagion, which we've mentioned earlier today. A viral attraction of distance and withdrawal alongside an immediacy of intensity, a present-ing that creates, to quote Nancy, quote, a force that forces form to touch itself. A force that forces form to touch itself. And what is this force that forces form, makes, compels, demands form to touch itself in the fullest sensuous masturbatory meaning of touching oneself. It is nothing more and nothing less than a radical intensity, an immediacy shot through and with, indeed corrupted by the senses. Okay, let us begin again. And what is this force that forces, makes, compels, demands, form to touch itself? 
It is the attraction, sensuous, erotic, curious, hungry, of a cohito dot of a being their interiority, right now, right here, able to touch itself while simultaneously able to dis dash appear, to dish dis dash appear, as in to disjunctively take a step apart, create a distance, all the while durationally while, all the while touching in the fullest sense to lick, to penetrate and be penetrated, apart and yet together. An odd kind of black hole aesthetics. This ontologically curious, ontologically productive, substantive, sensuous, forced to touch and be touched cohito, both disappearing and simultaneously re-presenting itself, not as a model or as a representation, but as a radical intensity. This radical intensity is so named because in, these, in this carnal dance of touch and be touched surface interiorities, a kind of plural or multiply dimensional materiality, what I call an ana, A-N-A, ana materiality, neither real nor unreal, neither time stamped but completely temporal, is made manifest. And that thing, das Ding, that thing that is made manifest has a very common name, image. We could call it also photography. Thus, as Jean-Luc Nancy neatly summarizes in his The Ground of an Image Cohito S. Imago, it gets worse. Or maybe it gets better. But for better or for worse, three points follow from this claim. First, one begins to see that the image not to mention cohito, both the mind's eye and the cohito dot of a being their interiority, is to echo the work of, of Henry Rogers in his The Words I Thought I Saw, and to paraphrase Jean-Luc Nancy, the image is neither world nor language. It is a surface that eats and is eaten by this double dance, emboldened by dark room aesthetics. Cojito es imago. Second, because this cojito equals an image, this visual thing is forced to form, is forced to force form to touch itself, it leaps out of the realm of the Hegelian idea to establish what Nancy names the sacred. Sacred as in the Muslim, Judeo Christian sense of standing apart, no graven image at the same time apart. Third and final, the image, not graven, the image which stands apart whilst being there does not embolden or inhabit identity. It does not embolden or inhabit identity or indeed have anything to do with identity. For this standing apart while standing together, touching, penetrated, penetrating, etc., is not the same as the now infamous, in this, certainly in this school, because we talk about it a lot, now, now the infamous uh, A equals A from the Heideggerian move in Identity and Difference, where A equals A are stuck together, it is not about the Heideggerian sense of belonging and simultaneously want to be alone, put together and apart, nor is it forming a totalized unity sutured and cohered via a thesis, antithesis, sublation. For in its very presence, the presence of image is precisely and nothing other than the radical connectedness, the radical sur-face, surface, surface self-coincidence, the fatal attraction of black hole dark rooms embodying, disrobing the senses themselves in all their fractal, interactive roughness. A dis-identity over to Jean-Luc. In coming to the fore, the image goes within. But it's within is not anything other than it's for. Sometimes you can get like knife in the head with these philosophers. In coming to the fore, the image goes within. But it's within is not anything other than it's for. Its ontological content is surface, exposition, expression. The surface here is not relative to a spectator facing it. 
It is the site of a concentration in coincidence. That is why it has no model, and that is why it makes no sense to speak of it in terms of representation, semiotics, dialectical materialism, not to mention social agency. Its model is in it. It is its idea or its energy. It is an idea that is energy, a pressure, traction, and attraction of sameness, not an idea in the Hegelian sense as idea or adilon, but is an intelligible form, a force that forces form to touch itself. If the spectator remains across from, from it, if the spectator remains across from it, facing it, that spectator, that self, that she who stands in front and rationalizes the image sees only a disjunction between resemblance and dissimilarity. But if she enters into this self-coincidence, then she enters into the image. She no longer looks at it, she, though she does not cease to be in front of it. She no longer looks at it, though she no longer ceases to be in front of it. She penetrates it, is penetrated by it distance and distinction at the same time." Unquote. One could say that the image, neither world nor language, is a real presence. This presence is a sacred Im uh, intimacy that a fragment of, sorry, that a fractal of matter gives to be taken in and absorbed. It is a real presence because it is contagious. It is a, this is a quote now from Jean-Luc, it is a real presence because it is a contagious presence, participating and participated, communication and communicated in the distinction of its intimacy. But in this way, but in this way, it does not exist. Sense exists. It is the movement and flight of exiting, of es iré, of going outside oneself, exceeding, exiling, for sense, is in the picture and sense essentially disidentifies. Okay, I have taken you on a somewhat complicated journey at the end of the day. Well done for everyone not collapsing in mental anguish or fatigue. Apart from everything else I have tried to develop in this little bit of a story, at least one takeaway from this darkroom aesthetic being presented today is that the well-worn phrase of Heidegger, to wit, technology is nothing technological, may begin to make some more sense, especially now when it comes to discussing photography, the digital, the human, or any other kind of being, and the image. Analog or digital technological advancement, enhancement, is not really the issue. But neither is it about a logic of techna. Sorry, all you Heideggerian fans out there. Nor about a poetic, per se. That is, a logic relying on the ability to grasp an out there, Dasein, to create that relation of little b being entity to big b being in all its glorious folds, dwellings, and ontotheologics. It is rather, it is rather to go one lateral step further, the gathering, sorry, it is, the gathering is far more wildly libidinal, far more electric, far more uncertain, more jagged, and though it has a logic, it is without a necessary rationality. Indeed, it is radically uncertain whilst being iteratively connected in the carnal knowledge cohito sense of the senses. Dirty, dirty, those dark rooms of life, those practicalities of sonorous, sensuous imaging. You know, Baudelaire was very worried about photography. He thought rightly that it had a common alliance with what he called the mob, with the, with, with the people, what he called the mob. And just like the mob, photography, since its birth, has refused to know its place. Just like a rusty old schoolmaster, or maybe a swivel-eyed loon, which I wanted to get in. <laughs> Who knew the Tories would come into their own here? Admonishing an unruly pupil, Baudelaire tut-tuts his fears as such. Quote, if photography is permitted to supplement some of art's functions, they will forthwith be usurped and corrupted by it, thanks to photography's natural alliance with the mob. It must therefore revert to its proper duty, which is to serve as the handmaiden of science and the arts. 
how upset he would be were he alive today. For not only has photography gone and corrupted art, it's gone and corrupted the very bastion of civilization, philosophy. Okay, that's it. Thank <laughs> you.